How many want to live blessed, right? How many want their kids to live blessed, right? I do. I mean, I believe God wants us to live blessed. Um, when we use these words, there are two words we use, prosper and poverty. And uh, there's a lot that we've seen over the age of the church in America that when you hear the word prosper, we almost want to feel like, oh, that's a bad word in the church, which is what Satan does. He loves to make bad what God has declared is good, right? I don't know any parent that doesn't want or does want their kid to prosper. Like, we want our kids to do well, right? Why would we think God wouldn't want us to prosper as well, right? And uh, But there are some things in life um, that we do when we engage where we, like, we... We, we're all with God. There's some things we're like, I'm engaged in, I want to engage in, show me how to engage in. And then there are some things that God tells us where we stiff arm them. You know, like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to engage you, God, in all of these areas of my life, in healing and signs, wonders, and miracles. I'm going to engage you in the world, but, but I'm going to stiff arm you in an area of my life. And part of that is, has to do with our money and our resources, right? My time, my energy. I'm going to stiff arm God. Like he's, he's Lord of most of my life, right? And the reality is if he isn't Lord of everything, he isn't Lord. It just, it's impossible to call him Lord if he isn't Lord. And there's areas when, when we talk about engaging in those areas, there's some areas we just don't want to, if, if we have no problem in that area, um, we're cool. We're, we're going to amen today. It, it, there's, but if we're not, we're going to be annoyed. Don't get annoyed. Realize that if you're stiff-arming God and his word in an area, it's, you're stiff-arming the blessing he has for your life. That, that there isn't anything God tells us to do that, that like we're opposing his blessing when we do that. And we want to we wanna kind of go into this. Something that I brought up the next last few weeks was uh, God became human, but one of the first names he revealed to us in the Old Testament, and if you're reading through the Bible with us, um, (laughs) you're all enjoying Leviticus right now. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) I'm a pastor, and I'm I'm being challenged at the moment to read every word. Um, All I have to say is one lesson I've learned is thank God we're not living in that day and age or I'd be one bloody mess, (laughs) literally one bloody mess, right, Uh, killing animals. But one of the things he reveals all the way back after a creator and I am, the first Jehovah he reveals is Jehovah Jireh. And I think really in a world where we are filthy rich, we live in a world where we're filthy rich. I, I've, I've been all over the world. You know that. I've been to Africa and Europe and, and South America and South Asia, South East Asia, all over the place. And I've seen people with nothing praise the Lord like they, God, God has done everything. I've seen them give beyond their ability to give. I've seen that. And in America, you come in, what, uh, it's, so, it's almost as if we're, we have a poverty mentality, like we're not the prosperous kids that he's blessed us with, right? And as a church, you've, been, uh, you've blessed nations through your giving. But Jehovah Jireh means he's my provider. He provides. Like, and, and I give as though I serve Jehovah Jireh. And the only reason I wouldn't give, the only reason I wouldn't give of my resources in time is because I'm afraid I won't have enough. So I'm living out of fear than I'm living out of faith in the one who is the Jehovah Jireh, who's declared himself to be Jehovah Jireh. Does that make sense? So... If God, and we stiff, in fear, we stiff arm God. We say, God, I don't know that I can trust. Can I just tell you, God is devoted to you. And if you'll get the, the, what we're going to talk about over the next few weeks, and you're, you want to be here every week because um, in this series, the, it, we, there's some just great words that are going to cause you to grow over the next few weeks, and you're going to be blessed through them. But you know, some, some of us struggle to believe that God is working for our best, that God is for you, and who can be against you, right? right? Um, 
even though there are times it seems like he's working against you, look on the, the slide behind me because you, you just got to take a picture of this or just kind of get this in your spirit. If you feel God is working against you, it's because what you're trying to do is not for your best. God, God will work against things that will try to destroy you. Say, I don't know why God isn't blessing me. If you're living with a selfish or a greedful heart, he isn't going to bless it. He isn't going to bless it. Faith is the key in this. You, you believe he's your provider, but, and, and faith is derived from what we believe. If I believe he's my provider and he gives me everything I need and his children don't beg for bread, that when I give, it's a different way of thinking. I used to think I was my provider. I used to think I did what I needed to do for me and mine and my family, that it was all st stemmed from me and what I could work for, I pulled up this, my, my own strings and my own bootstraps mentality, right? You all know, and, and when I came into the kingdom of God, I realized I surrendered that mentality and now I repented and in my repentance, I'm thinking differently. Now I realize he, he has given me everything I need. He is giving me everything I have and he will provide for me when I'm obedient to what he says in his word. Yeah. And I'm blessed, not because I have all of this supplied to me, I'm blessed because I get to let blessing flow through me to others. I live a life, I'm living blessed, which means I have a life that is blessing people around me and that's where the true blessing is. Yeah. Amen. There are a whole lot of wealthy people in the world who are not prospering. So this truth, the truth in this series will change your life. It will change your pocketbook. It's going to change your marriage, your job, your health, your children. It's going to change everything in your life, I promise you, okay? So turn to Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. It says, judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judged, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So here's a simple question for you. Is the word money anywhere in those two verses? Is, is it anywhere in those verses at all? Okay, good. So, I would need you to commit something to memory. Say this with me. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Right? One more time. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Okay, now, now say this with me. With the measure you use, you use it, will it will be measured back to you. Now, is that in your memory right there, in the measure? Judge not, it makes sense. It really refers to this idea of sowing and reaping, which we'll talk about in a moment. Now I want you to go to Luke chapter 6. You're going to find a parallel passage here. Now, the interesting thing about Luke, and it's why... Um, people say, well, why can you have faith in the Bible, or at least in the Gospels especially, is because the Gospels were recorded by different people from different places of, of backgrounds. Luke was a pagan that got saved and came to Christ, and then he went around and interviewed firsthand account, people who experienced it for the first hand, and because he was such a detailed person, he, you will find often in Luke more details than you will maybe in Matthew. It's, it's an interesting, so he's coming from a firsthand account, and Luke gives more detail in this verse, in this parallel passage. He says in verse 37, judge not, and you shall not be judged, right? Does that sound familiar? Right? In verse 38, he says, for with the same measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Right? That, but let's read the whole passage because there's a section in the middle. Here's what it says. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Do, do you notice that I'm saying something a lot? <laughs> I, I just hoped you noticed that, maybe. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Does the word money appear anywhere in that passage? 
But most of the time when you hear that passage written, if you've been in the church any length of time, you always think it talks about money, but it's not talking about money. And the reason it's not talking about money is because it's talking about something far greater. It's talking about your heart. It's talking about a generous heart, a heart that gives. What has happened for a lot of people is they, they've done the church thing, but they've never moved past the heart issue. And we have this heart issue. And just like as a Christian, the first thing you need to learn is how to know the voice of God so that you can follow his voice when he speaks to you and tells you he wants to do. The second thing you need to learn and, and deal with is you need him to heal your heart. Because you will never move past the cross into the kingdom of God if you don't have a heart that is generous and gives. Not just in money. In your resources, your time, your love, your attention. Everything, your t- everything that you have is his and you want to be generous so that you become a flow through to people around you. Jesus said where your treasure is there your heart is as well. You all know that verse, right? Well, my wife and I, one of the things we knew, and we, we practiced, these are simple principles in the kingdom of God. One of them is, if I'm going to raise my kids, the first thing I'm going to teach them before math, before reading, before all of those things, because if you think, like they're literally, as parents, they ain't missing school. We're going to have them in school, you know, the school, school, school. But if we miss church, it's no big deal. The more important things, you won't be fretting when they're in their 20s getting high that they didn't miss school. You'll be fretting, oh boy, I wish they would have been serving the Lord. How many parents in here know what I'm talking about? It's about knowing Christ, right? And so there were things that we did to try to help our kids to ensure that they would follow the Lord. One of them was to teach them to be generous, Because where your treasure is, what happens to your heart? It follows the treasure. So if we could teach our kids to put their treasure in the kingdom of God, to give the missions, to do what they, then their heart would follow it, right? God, you know, one of the statement people, I've heard this multiple times from people. And then when they find out I'm a pastor, they don't say it. But on a golf course, you know, when I'm there, I try not to tell people I'm a pastor because then they, they change. They have this salvation experience after I hear that I'm a pastor. It's a crazy thing. Like somehow I'm going to vouch for them in heaven. But you'll hear all the church wants is my money. Right? Right? Can I, can I tell you something? All God wants is your money. Some of you are like, did you just hear that? <laughs> Maybe I heard that wrong. Listen, all God wants is your money. That he does, that you've heard it right here. I heard a pastor, pull your phone out if you want to record it. All God wants is your money. All he wants is your money. The only thing, the, the, uh, God is after your money because he's after your heart. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know the only place in the Bible where it says that, where he says, you will either serve me or you're going to serve the spirit that's on your money, mammon. Yeah. Yeah. If money is hard to give away, it's because that money has a spirit called mammon that is your provider. And we don't give away our idols. Does, it, does that make... Now, I'm not saying you're going to hell. I'm not saying you're going to hell. You don't have to tithe and do all of that to go to heaven, and that's part of the problem. We think, because I don't have to do that to go to heaven, somehow we think then, I won't do it. I'll have an idol with him, because mammon... I'll, but Jesus himself said... That, that if you're going to serve me, you're not serving mammon and money. Yes. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is, right? Have you ever noticed how your money's connected to your heart? Like, how many had a wallet once you put in your back pocket? Some of you do, it gave you back issues. You know what I'm talking about? 
Like when you reached, you went, oh, yeah, that hurt. How many, some of you, you know what, right? You know, when we were in uh, Michigan, we had an investment uh, group and the, somebody who had done investments in stocks and stuff. He, 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 we, we would invest $50 a month. That's what you put in every month. And you kept your money you invested, but all the profits from the investments went to missions. And we, we did it to teach people how to invest, and, and then we were able to give to missions. Well, so I started investing on the side. And you know what's interesting? Is when I started investing into stock, I almost needed another computer for every 10 minutes refresh. Ref- I was, I didn't even care for those companies. Like, I didn't even know who those companies were until I invested in them. And then all of a sudden, I had to research them. I had to follow. Why? Because my heart followed the treasure I put in it. Right? See, if you, if you don't have a heart for missions and you say, I would love to have a heart for missions, put some treasure in it and you'll have a heart for missions. If you don't have a heart for the church, put your time in the church and you'll start to have a heart for the church. When you put your resources that God has given you into the, wherever you put them is where your heart's going to go. So where is your treasure? This is a, it really comes back to a heart issue. When we're talking about judgment, condemnation, forgiveness, but it, this passage was really talking about giving. Am I a giving person? You know what my hope is, is that every one of your funerals, at every one of them, and Jerry chuckles down here. She's like, yeah, that's getting close, isn't it? (laughs) She's like, yeah. (laughs) At every one of our funerals, I hope it's said of us by people who come to the funeral, they were a very giving person. Out of all the things they were, of all the things they did, They were generous. Because the reality is, I can't preach a single message and not talk about giving. Every single thing, if I'm being faithful to God's word, comes back to God's willingness to be generous. And calling us into the identity of who God is to be the same, just as he is the same. You know the the principle of the law of sowing and reaping, right? Isn't it amazing how we know the law of sowing and reaping? but we don't always live with that mentality. Like when we know it's a law, not a theory, because if you plant a seed, it produces a harvest that has many seeds. It multiplies. And it's interesting that when you, when you do an act, you do something, like judge a person. If I judge this person, all of a sudden I receive judgment in return, but it's way more than I deserved. And I say, that's way more than I deserved. Actually, it's a fulfillment to the principle of law of sowing and reaping. I always reap more than I deserved. So there are not only curses, if I sow curses, I'm going to reap way more than I deserve back. You say, if you feel like you're being judged more than other people, you should really consider the seed you're planting. You really should, because the reality is that you're probably sowing that in places, and you, need, you, you just shut that off, and it'll change, right? In the same way, and this is what I love about this law of sowing, if you sow blessing, you're going to reap it more than you deserve, How many want to reap it way more? And here's what's amazing. And you read the Old Testament, you go through this. You see that it goes from generation to generation. Not only will you reap more than you deserve, but generations after you will reap from what you've sown into the kingdom of God. It goes way beyond. So there are four perspectives of the heart. Here's the first one. And they're very quick. These aren't the points, but they're very quick. First one is, I love to give. I give whenever I can. If I look for opportunities to give, if I'm walking, like I wake up in the morning and I'm like, where am I going to give today? I'm going to find people who are discouraged and I'm going to give them encouragement because it's my heart. It's my desire. It's who I am. I don't even think about it. This is the incredible thing about a worldview in the kingdom of God. I don't have to even think about it. I just give. I love it. I don't have to hear a voice from heaven saying, thou shalt give it today. I just do it because it's who I am. And when you do that, you look the most like God. 
It just flows right out of you. And then there are those people like the Pharisees that would count out dill seed. Have you ever seen a dill seed? I mean, you got to have a microphone. You just got to. And they would separate a tenth because they were going to obediently give. I'm going to give only when God tells me to give. And I'm only going to give exactly what he tells me to give. And I'm only going to give when I hear the audible voice of God tell me to give. Right? I, I, I am not going to give anything beyond that or above that, only to that. Now, how many would say, God, I only want you to give me what you have to give me. I don't want anything more than that. Only what you have to give me. Then there's the person who says, I want to give, but I know I should give, but I just can't. You know, I know, Pastor, I hear you. I get it. Man, I get, I get all inspired to give until I write the check. Or you, some of you don't even, a check is a piece of paper <laughs> that when you write something on it and you put a number and it serves like cash, well, you don't even know what cash is anymore. <laughs> right? <laughs> it, you, I want to, and I'm right there, and I almost do it. Won't that be? I like that. But I'm going to heaven. I'm going to heaven, so, so it's fine. I just, I just can't do it, because what if I don't have enough? And God says, I'm Jehovah Jireh. I know you are, but what if you're not? I know you are for them, but what if you're not for me? And it goes right back to the salvation. I, there, we no longer believe we're of that life, but we are now children. You're saved by your faith. You believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that he is my Jehovah Jireh. That's salvation. It's when we get to that point where we start believing, yeah, I believe you're that for them, but not for me, that you have to ask yourself, am I saved? Because you're saved by your faith that he paid for you. And you belong to him. Are you telling me he's irresponsible when it comes to you? And that he's shirking his irresponsibility and taking care of you? He has taken on responsibility for you by purchasing your sin and making you a child of God. So we leave behind the old way of thinking that I'm the provider of my life. And we say, you are the provider of my life. And when I give and when I tithe, we're saying, okay, God, show me your God of my life. Show me who you are. I give out of faith in who he is. And then there's the person, and no one's going to tell you this really right to your face, but they think it, is I just, I refuse to give. I don't care if God speaks, I am not giving. I am not doing it. I'm not giving. There's no way I'm giving. You aren't going to convince me to give. I'm just not doing it. I don't need to. I'm not under the law. Can I tell you, if you've been through the Bible like we've been going through the Bible, the number of times we talked about tithing in Genesis, tithing isn't even part of the law. Tithing was a law of creation. It's a principle of creation. So, and if you ever stop to consider, I'm not under the law, I'm under grace. So you're telling me you're lawless? There has never been a society that's prospered in lawlessness. It's, it's an incredible, it's just what happens when we get so far away from the truth. Deuteronomy says this, if there is among you a poor person of your brethren within any, any of the gates of your land, which the Lord your God is giving you, you have to believe, if, you, if this is true, you have to believe everything you have comes from God. You shall not harden your heart nor shut the, your hand from your poor brother, but you shall open your hand wide to him, willingly lend him sufficient for his needs, whatever he needs. Listen, 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 listen. If you're here and you're that, I refuse to give, I work hard, everything I have is for me. You're going to hear this a number of times in this series. If you believe that, and I know you don't, and you, you know how I know you don't? Because you will not pray this prayer. If you really believe that, you'll pray this prayer. This is what you'll say. 
God, I believe everything I have is because of my doing, my effort, my hard work, me putting in my abilities to do all of it. I want you to take all of your toys and go home. Everything that you've given me, just take home. Everything that, that is part of my life, I want you... You know what would happen? You'd turn to a powder of dust. You know why? Because it's his word that's still holding you together. Whether you're a believer or not, by his mercy over your sinful, evil life, he has held you together by his word. And if he takes his toys and go home, he's taking his word with you and you'll... Pfft, you'll cease to exist. But you won't pray that prayer because you know... That everything you have is going to be here, was here before you got here, and it will be here after you get here, because it isn't yours. That's what Solomon was saying when he says, it's just miserable. I do all of this work for something that isn't mine. God gives it to us. He blesses us. So the first, there's four conditions of the heart. Here's the first one. Deal with your selfish heart. Deuteronomy 15, 6 says, Beware lest there be a wicked thought in your heart, saying, The seventh year, the year of release, which we, we call the year of jubilee, is at hand, and your eye, uh, your eye be evil against your poor brother, and you give him nothing, and he cry out to the Lord against you, and it becomes sin among you. The selfishness is wickedness in God's eyes. Selfishness is... It, you know what, what's amazing to me? Isn't it amazing how we'll look at the drug addict, the alcoholic, the person who uh, is taking uh, substances that are destroying their body as being the worst sinners when God says the most wicked are the selfish? They're not like him. They don't look like him. Selfishness is anti-God. He says, if you're, if you're like one of my kids... You're going to be generous. You're going to give. And, and in the stories, what's happened is this year of Jubilee, it's an interesting thing. God had set it up that in the year of Jubilee, so it was in cycles. It wasn't like you made a loan and in seven years there was year of Jubilee. It was a cycle. And, and every seventh year was the year of Jubilee. And when you read, you're reading through the Old Testament, the Sabbath is kind of a big deal to God. And seven means completion. It, it's the mean, word of the meaning, completion. We're, doing the, we're going to Turkey in a few weeks to do the series next, the, the campaign for next year. And seven's the name of the series. It means completion, the complete church. And, and, uh, and, and in this, every seven year, if you were a slave, in the seventh year, you were set free. You were free from being a slave. Like people would sell themselves into slavery in order to pay a debt, and then that, that slave owner would have to set you free in the year of Jubilee. And, and if you had a debt in the seventh year, it'd be, you'd have to be set free. What he's saying is, if someone comes to you and asks for money or a loan, and you're in the six and a half year of that cycle, you know Jubilee's coming in half a year. Don't have an evil thought and not give to them. Yeah. Yep. That you're to give to them. Now, how many would love to have a year of Jubilee in America? Some of you be like, amen, praise, I feel the Lord. All the borrowers in the room are saying amen. All the lenders in the room are saying, I rebuke that thinking. I'm not under the law, praise the Lord, right? The, the, here's, the, here's, the, here's the reality. If you, it's a different way of thinking. Follow with me. In the world, that's absurd. In America, the American dream says that type of economy is absurd. That way of thinking is totally absurd. That's not the way God would want it today. Just wait, I got a verse for you. <laughs> God says, I don't want you to be mortgagers. I don't want you to be lenders. I want you to be givers. If you have the ability to set someone free, set them free. I want you to be people of Jubilee. You know, selfishness is wickedness. God wants us to be generous as he is generous. So why did God create giving and tithing? Some would say, well, he needed it because God, you know, has to pay his bills. You know, electric bill's pretty high. The inflation's been hard on God. 
He's not only had to create electricity, and he's now got to pay for it. And then, of course, the government taxes him on that, which he did. If God taxed the government, you know, we'd, we'd even have a bigger debt. God didn't create giving for his sake. He created it for your sake. Giving is more than any other, than any other activity that a believer does. Works selfishness and greed out of your life. When you give, this is what's happening. When you give away, when you give to something, what you're doing is, God, I don't even necessarily have it to give, but I feel like I, I want to be a part of this, so I'm going to give, and then I'm going to wait. I'm going to bless, and in faith, I know you're going to take care of me because your children don't beg for bread. And I think like a child of God. I don't beg for bread. I don't beg. In fact, this church, a former pastor of this church, many, many years ago, in a board meeting, in fact, I think there was a board member over here sitting in that board meeting, when they didn't have enough to pay their bills, and they decided as a leadership group that they were going to give everything they had away because they didn't have enough to pay for what they had to pay. And so they just gave it away to missions. And God supplied their needs. Amen. It's why we give and tithe the missions. It's why we give 20% of our budget to missions because we believe that if we're going to do the work we need to do in the kingdom of God, we have to trust, lean on him and not on our own ability. Yeah. Do you believe that? Yeah. There's this preaching out there, give to get. If you give $10, you're going to get it back. And you know what's amazing? That's even true. It's true. Money does come back to you. People who give, it tends to attract money to them. Isn't it funny how we, how we look at other people and say, well, I got, why doesn't God bless me like he blesses them? Because you're stiff-arming God and they're embracing him. You're, you're stiff-arming his word and they're embracing him. And we're looking for ways. Well, if uh, it's like a Ponzi scheme. If you put in 10, you'll get 100 in return. All that's doing, that attitude, that motivation, it's truth, but the motivation of our heart with that truth is selfish. I just want to get something. I don't care who I'm helping. Remember last week what I said about the Pharisees? They said, show us another sign. And Jesus is like, did you not see the people? All you want to see is signs. You don't want to see the people. You just want miracles. You don't see the needs met. You don't see how it impacted their life. There is one, however, one area that God condones selfishness. There is one area, and uh, I don't have a verse yet. I'm looking for it. I'll find it. <laughs> but there is one area. We were at McDonald's a number of years ago, my wife and I on vacation. We rarely go there, but we were there. It was the only one thing there, and um, there was a ham, egg, and cheese it's sandwich. I was. I like those, and, and they're really not food. Uh, the winch logs. Maybe you know the winch logs. They actually have a ham, egg, and cheese from six years ago that has not even got mold or anything on it. It's not real. Imagine what that does in your body. It's just horrible. But I, when I get one, it's like it's still there. I got about six of them still in my stomach. <laughs> you know, they're they're there. They're hard, kind of hard to get rid of. I'll have to have them surgically removed. But. Uh, we're sitting there, and, and I go, I'd like a ham, egg, and cheese, and, uh, and an orange juice. And I go, Heather, w would you like something? She goes, no. And I said, okay. Then, then and I said, you sure you don't want it? She goes, no. And I go, okay, so then that's all we need. She go, and then I hear her go, I'll just have a bite of yours. <laughs> I'm like, one second, ma'am. I'm going to order your own sandwich. All I want is a bite. I know I, you can take one bite out of it and throw it away. But I am eating my whole sandwich. <laughs> How many men in here say amen? <laughs> Ladies, men are allowed to be selfish when it comes to their food. <laughs> uh, all the ladies in the room are like, that's what you get when you got a man pastor preaching up there. <laughs> get Heather up there and we'll see what she has to say. She's going to be preaching in a few weeks, months. 
Here's the second one. Deal with your selfish heart. Deal with your grieving heart. Deuteronomy 15.10 says, you shall surely give to him and your heart should not be grieved when you give to him because of, for this thing, the Lord your God will bless you in all your works and all the, to which you put your hand. Have you ever given away something and then something broke? And you're like, oh, if I had just kept that money and have it to pay for this, Right? Selfishness attacks you before you give, but grieving and greed attack you after you give. You grieve what you gave away. Boy, I wish I hadn't given that away. And, and then you grieve it, right? <laughs> this is kind of strange, actually. While I've been preaching, I, I've been thinking after the service, we're going out to lunch. And it just occurred to me that I didn't bring any money that I didn't have any money at all. And uh, it just occurred to me that I don't know how I'm going to pay for the. Oh, Molly, thank you. A hundred dollars. Wow, we're going to a nice place today. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So isn't it amazing how she just came up and gave? She's already learning from the message. That's amazing. <laughs> you know what's amazing about that is uh, before I came in, I actually talked to Molly and uh, gave her a hundred dollars for this service. <laughs> and 100 for the next one from my bank account. From my bank account, uh, I got this. And, uh, and I gave it to her, and I said, there's a point when I, you know, and she, she brought it up to me. And you notice how bubbly she was and excited she was, and she's just so happy because she gave me this, and, um, and it was mine. And she knew it was mine, so it was no problem to give it to me because she was just bringing me back what was mine. It, it was really just mine. And because she was bringing it to me, because it was mine, I want to give it to you. See, here's the thing. When you know everything you have, you know, having more services is getting awfully expensive. I don't know that we'll be starting many more. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's amazing is uh, when, when you know everything you have comes from the Lord and you, you give something out, you realize you'll never have an, a want because God's already taken care of everything. And so my life shifts from a trying to attain all this stuff for retirement that will last this long in the scope of eternity to being able to just bless say, God bless you. God loves you. I don't know where you're from. It, it's amazing. It's amazing uh, how just little things that you do to give can speak to a heart and open a door, right? The reason we grieve after we give is because we thought it was ours. 1 Corinthians 10, 26 says, for the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness Here's the third one, develop a generous heart. Truthfully, you were created generous. You were born selfish. We're most like God when we're generous. We look like him, we're the image of God. John 3, 16 said, for God so loved the world that he gave. He gave. You look most like him and God has always been generous toward you, has he not? God desires to prosper you and he's preparing you for eternity where you think like there isn't anything. In fact, the only thing of value you can give is your heart and some of you are giving the most valuable thing you have to a football team. Some of you are giving the most valuable thing you have to your spouse. God says, first me. First me. You want a great marriage? Give your heart to God first. You want to prosper in life? Give your heart to God first. That doesn't mean you can't cheer for teams. That doesn't mean you can't have fun and enjoy life. But when you give your heart to it, you're giving it to something that cannot respond to you. Deuteronomy 15, 4 says, you shall supply him liberally from the flocks, from your threshing floor, from your wine press, from what the Lord your God has blessed you with, you shall give to him. Do you know, just because you got a bonus doesn't mean it was meant for you. I've had that happen. We've given cars away. When we had almost nothing, God said, you're gonna give that car to someone who has less than you. I'm like, yeah, but 
I could use the money from it. And he's, he's, a long time ago, he said, I'm going to teach you to trust me. Best thing that ever happened in our life was the hardest door to walk through. When you're handing the keys to a car, knowing I, I, I can't even afford to buy another car, and now I'm giving, and then God provides it. Can I always tell you, God always provides something way better than you could have ever bought. He just wants your heart. He wants to know you trust him, that you see him as Jehovah Jireh. So I'm not telling you this. Oh yeah, sure, pastor. You think I'm that kind of, I'm not trying. Just try it. Try being generous. You'll know what I'm talking about. Luke chapter 6, 30 to 36 says, give to everyone who asks of you. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> everyone who asks of me, you got $20. See, of course, you're in the front row, too. Don't, no, I'm not asking. <laughs> Give to everyone who asks of you. Like, what? If you have, you give it. Why? You have no hesitation to give it, not because even you have a heart for it, but because you know God will provide for it. And you say, surely you give to everyone who deserves it. Okay, let's read on. And from him who takes away your goods, do not ask for them back. So it's not a loan. I'm going to give to you. And just as you want men to do to you, you also do them likewise. But if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even the sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive it back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back. But love your enemies do good and lend, hoping for nothing for your enemies? Think of the one person in your mind that you least want to be generous to. Think about that person. You thinking about that person right now? The least, you thinking about that person right now? Okay, some of you are like, I don't have that. I, I have no enemies. <laughs> Praise God, right? But if you're thinking of someone right now, here's a challenge to you. Send them money. Say, I was thinking of you and I just wanted to bless you. Send it to them. They may still see you as an enemy, but once you put your treasure into blessing them, you will no longer see them as an enemy. Because where your treasure goes, your heart starts to follow it. And look what he says. And your reward will be great. Therefore, be merciful just as your father also is mer merciful. Give to anyone ask. You know, one of the first lessons a child needs to learn is to share. Right? Mine! And they're not German. <laughs> Mine! Mine. Uh, honey, you should share. Mine. Hopefully, they're not saying mine at 30. So when are you going to grow up? As children of God, when do we grow up? The fourth heart is to develop a grateful heart. De Deuteronomy 15, 15 says, you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore, I command you this thing. Be grateful. It, if you are grateful for what God did for you, <laughs> you'll be generous. You'll be generous with your worship. You'll be generous with your life. You'll just be generous because God was so generous to me. You know what's amazing? You remember I always say, when you worship God, He worships you back. How many remember? You worship Him and He worships you back. It creates a circuit of worship. Worship is ascribing worth. If you worship God, you will not have an identity issue because He will deal with, He will ascribe worth to you and return it. And it literally is worship Him, He worships me. Worship Him, He worships me. It's like this reoccurring circle. When you're generous, he's generous with you. When you're generous, he starts, he's already been extraordinarily generous with you. He's just waiting for you to complete the circuit. But this much I can tell you, 
God will never bless, he will never prosper a stingy person. This is gonna bother some. He isn't gonna even bless a frugal person. He'll bless a wise person with their money. Who's wise? But a lot of time we use the word frugal to make us feel better about being stingy. When it'd be much better to be very generous. You can be wise in how you spend it, but be very generous in what you give to. Will you stand? This message is not meant to annoy you, to irritate you, to get upset. This message is to do exactly this, to give you freedom. To, to literally set you free from the stress of what money does to you, what mammon does. Well, I don't know if I'm going to have enough. I don't know if I'm going to do that. If you want to see God do a miracle, you say, Lord, right now, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm stepping into a new way of thinking. I'm stepping into my true identity of being generous right now. God, I'm, I'm calling on you to transform my heart to be the heart of God. Because how many know that you can't change your heart? You're not the source to change your heart. He's just waiting for an invitation for you to invite the Holy Spirit to come in and change your heart. And you know what's amazing about this? When he changes it, it won't be hard because it will become the desire of your heart. And you always do what you want to do. Say it with me. I always do what I want to do. So how does God deliver you? He changes the desire of your heart to be generous so that you can always do what you want to do. Will you do that right now? You can close your eyes. You can keep them open. You can raise your hands. You can keep them down. You can do whatever you want as long as you do this. Say, God, here I am change my heart. I'm ready. I'm ready. Change the desires of my heart to see what you see, to experience the power of generosity in my life. Do that right now. Do that right now.